Infrastructure debt continues to grow in its appeal for investors, ranging from insurance companies to pension funds. But can the asset class deliver attractive returns while also protecting investors from volatility? I would say with all the opportunities across all the various subsectors and all the tailwinds that we're seeing, I've never been as excited as I am about the opportunity set in infrastructure debt as I am today. That was Orhan Sorelli, head of North America with Bearings Global Infrastructure Debt Team. And this is Streaming Income, a podcast from Bearings. I'm your host, Greg Campion. Coming up on today's show, the evolving opportunity in infrastructure debt. All right, Orhan Sorelli, welcome to Streaming Income. Thank you, Greg. Pleasure to be here. Excited to have you here. I think it's a very timely time to be discussing what we're here to discuss today, which is infrastructure debt, the opportunity that you see, and a lot of the dynamics that are going on in this market. But before we get into all those specifics, let's define our terms up front, if you don't mind. So can you help me just understand when you and the Bearings team talk about infrastructure debt, what are the asset types that you're actually referring to? And is there any common or unifying characteristic among them? I think it's a great start to the conversation, Greg, because it's an exciting time in general for infrastructure, and we have seen infrastructure grow and evolve. And there are a lot of trends supporting that evolution. Having said that, though, we do believe there are some core aspects that make an asset, an infrastructure asset. Starting with, we sort of break infrastructure, and we think we're relatively consistent with the rest of the industry into six broad categories. There's economic infrastructure, for example, airports, toll roads. Um, There is social infrastructure. These are things like courthouses or hospitals that a state or municipality will look to build in partnership with a private operator. There's power and renewables. There is utilities and pipelines. There is midstream and storage for natural gas and oil products. And then finally, digital infra. But just because an asset fits within those six categories, that doesn't necessarily make it an infrastructure asset the way we would like to look at it. For us, the additional aspect is an essentiality aspect, which is a critical and core component of what makes an asset infrastructure. For example, there are airports out there that might be core to the location, but nobody flies in and out of the towns. So we look at very much like how important is the asset, not just to the equity and the lender, but also to the core customer base. And fortunately, a lot of these assets have decades of history where we can get gain comfort around that. But it's that essentiality aspect that we look to for um, generations of usage and or contracts that align well with the ultimate customer. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. It's quite a diverse group of assets that you just described. Um, And I'm curious, as you and the team think about sourcing these assets, I'm sure that's really uh, an interesting part of the business. So let's talk about how that works. This is obviously quite different than some of the public market asset classes that we might discuss on this podcast from time to time. Uh, This is a much more privately negotiated market, et cetera. So tell me a little bit about just how sourcing generally works in this market. Yeah. Historically, infrastructure has not been readily available for most institutional or individual investors. Perhaps you could buy utility stocks on the stock exchange and bonds, but generally most of infrastructure is privately negotiated. Mm -hmm. And historically, I'd say anywhere about around 90% of all debt financings have been done in the bank market, where uh, an institutional or individual investor would rarely see those kind of financing opportunities come to them. Mm. So, uh, yes, it is a private market and it relies heavily on having relationships. And the three main channels where we source our deals, I would say, are directly with the sponsors. And that has been a fast growing segment of the uh, infrastructure universe, almost all private equity driven. Hmm. On top of that, there's the traditional bank market, both from bank deals that they themselves lend to and then look to distribute to investors like ourselves, Mm -hmm. or where they're working on behalf of a sponsor to arrange a debt financing. And we have great relationships with the banks. 
And then finally, advisors. Infrastructure, as it's growing, we're seeing an increasing number of advisors who are focusing on the segment. And there's a lot of bid activity around public-private partnerships where these advisors add a lot of value. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, like how that landscape might have changed recently. Obviously, we've had a lot of different changing dynamics in the broader economy. Uh, interest rates have obviously moved up quite a bit. We've had worries about a recession. Now, it seems like those worries are evaporating before our eyes, given some of the most recent economic data. And uh, obviously, inflation's been a big uh, recent concern. Is any of that affecting the sourcing environment right now? And I guess the other thought there is, you know, is when I have conversations with our real estate team, with um, our direct lending team, you know, given the kind of, you know, more, I would say, volatile economic backdrop, there's been a lot less activity in those transaction pipelines. Uh, I don't want to say they've slowed to a stop, but it seems like there's uh, more of a price discovery in those asset classes going on where you're seeing a lot of assets not change hands because buyer and seller need to figure out a price to agree on. Is that the case in infra debt today? I definitely think we've seen an impact from what you're talking about, particularly the interest rate environment. Um, like a lot of sectors, uh, particularly around long-term fixed assets such as infrastructure, interest rates are a critical component as, as fixed capital costs are a big driver of the value for investors. And we definitely saw a slowdown in M&A sometime around the third quarter of last year. Mm. And the M&A activity had kept sort of dormant. Um, through, I'd say, as recently as a couple of months ago. What is interesting, though, is right now we're as busy as I've ever seen our team be here in the U.S. Mm. What has helped infrastructure ride some of that volatility, I think, is right now we're seeing a very good confluence of organic trends that have been driving growth and have almost been cycle resistant in many ways, tied together with sort of a reemergence of M&A. Right now, we're working on three direct M&A finance opportunities directly with the sponsors. These are small and middle market type deals mm -hmm. and around assets that I think represent everything about infrastructure that we like, not tied to the broader economy right. um, and, and demonstrating good resilience to both inflation and recession risk. And the appetite from the sponsors continues to be strong there. but. Will we see the big M&A deals in the near future? Possibly. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, th that spot still continues to be a little quiet. Okay. Yeah, that, that's fascinating to hear just how busy you are, because I think that is, based on my perception, I feel like that's an outlier versus some of the other private asset classes um, that we're looking at these days. I, I think as an example of that, Greg, yeah. so far this year through June 30th, mm -hmm. in the US, we have done more volume than we did in, in all of 2022 hmm. in terms of dollar volume invested. Hmm. And is that any driven by any one sector in particular, or is that pretty broad based? Yeah, great question. You know, the, the midstream environment post pandemic, after oil and gas prices sort of plummeted, sometimes to negative prices, as expected, it has rebounded. And the appetite, you know, particularly with geopolitical uh, concerns sort of driving energy security, natural gas demand has been very strong. And we have seen a tremendous uptick in natural gas uh, midstream activity. And we have benefited from that. And we have invested quite a bit. I'd say that's probably been the leading subsector that we focused on. Mm -hmm. Economic infrastructure is being resilient. Okay. Um, social infrastructure opportunities, what we call public-private partnerships or P3s, mm -hmm. those continue to sort of hold their own. So yeah, so there are certain subsectors that are benefiting from that. And digital infra, again, also is one of those subsectors that it, it is just a trend that's not going away. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think to your point, the kind of lower correlation with the macro economy for this asset class and, and some of these really, you know, long dated essential assets that you're talking about, it would make sense that you see, you know, less of a slowdown in terms of the deal pipeline, I guess, during times of economic volatility. Knock on wood, we hope it continues. <laughs> okay. So we talked a little bit about sourcing. Let's talk about the other side of the equation. So let's talk about on the investor side, who's buying infrastructure debt these days and why? I mean, we know that 
this traditionally has been uh, an attractive uh, asset class for insurance companies. Uh, but tell me kind of your latest thinking there, what you're seeing, what you're hearing from uh, LPs, where that inbound interest for the asset class is coming from today. Yeah, I'd say historically, and this goes back decades, it's been primarily banks and insurance companies mm -hmm. who were the main participants in the infrastructure debt market. We have definitely seen that evolve. As asset managers and sponsors have developed their own infrastructure debt strategies as part of an asset allocation model, that investor set is diversified. We have seen pension funds start become increasingly interested in the space. It is a good alternative to infrastructure equity and other alternatives, and generally fits within their alternatives bucket. Mm. We continue to see strong demand from banks and insurance companies. We are starting to see incrementally more demand from family offices and wealth management channels. So mm. it is definitely becoming, I'd say, a more conventional type of product. You could argue, uh, I would certainly argue that you know 5% allocation, which seems to be kind of a broad range where a lot of asset allocation models sort of point to. Mm -hmm. If, in my opinion, infrastructure is too core an asset to be that small a bucket, but I'm biased. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, well, that's interesting to hear that it's broadening out. I mean, are you still, uh, I, I guess, what are some of the most recent trends if you look at insurance companies specifically? What do you see in uh, specifically out of that channel? Yeah, it's really interesting in that I'd say for the first time in a few years, we're seeing an uptick in appetite from insurance companies regarding infrastructure debt, particularly investment grade hmm. infrastructure debt. I think based on my conversations, I think people are viewing that with the potential for a recession, who knows, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, certainly there were concerns there with the potential for inflation, the way it's run. Um, having a product that has appeared to be resistant to both recessions and inflation is a good diversifier from a fixed income portfolio perspective. Mm. And on top of that, you get all the other benefits that we've talked about with infrastructure. Um, it generally has shown incremental value pickup because it's generally a private market. So you have an illiquidity premium that you normally see. But on top of that, there's just a structuring premium that we think is embedded within the pricing. So both of those, I think, from a diversification perspective and a relative value perspective, we believe that's what's driving the incremental appetite, particularly from insurance companies. And it still, of course, fits very well from an asset liability management mm. perspective for a lot of those yep. types of investors. For sure. You mentioned that insurance companies are maybe a bit more interested in the investment grade. How about the non-investment grade part of this market? Where are you seeing interest there? Well, we think, and, and you know, we'll find this out as the cycle plays out, mm -hmm. but in this interest rate environment and in this M&A environment, particularly for the large type deals, if there is a slowdown, I think investors are starting to see non-investment grade infrastructure debt as potentially an increasingly attractive alternative for infrastructure equity. Mm -hmm. It demonstrates all the positive aspects of infrastructure that the equity product brings. We have always felt that right now where rates are, the infrastructure debt product brings commensurate current yield relative to core or core plus style equity options. So we think when you combine all those aspects, plus we believe the opportunity set of deal deployment is very good for debt, uncertain for equity. So we think when you combine all those aspects, we think pension fund investors and all other investors who invest in infrastructure equity might start looking at in non-investment grade infrastructure debt as a good alternative mm. for the next couple of years. Mm. That's interesting. And then um, I'm just curious, I know that uh, you know it could be kind of a mix of fixed and floating rate debt out there, but most of the transactions that are being structured today, how does that look? Or is it more fixed rate debt, more floating rate? And then what are the implications there from an investor's point of view? I think it has varied. Um, we still see strong appetite for both. It's kind of running 50-50 okay. broadly in the market from our perspective. Um, sometimes it's out of the investor's hands. Sometimes if you're not credit worthy enough to get interest rate swap lines from banks, you're almost by default having to do a fixed rate instrument. Mm -hmm. But for most of our, our borrowers who are credit worthy, uh, it really is just a uh, decision on their part. And we have seen some investors who want to lock out any interest rate volatility and just do a fixed rate instrument. Plenty of demand from sponsors for that. But we continue to see a lot of sponsors who believe that 
their assets can handle a rising rate environment and are willing to take the risk of floating rate. Got it. Got it. Okay. So we've uh, talked a little bit about sourcing. We've talked a little bit about who's buying. Let's talk about some of the big trends that are sort of underpinning this asset class um, in the years to come. Um, so tell me, you know, what are some of those more big thematic trends that you and the team are looking to invest into? Well, beyond the general broad investor appetite into the space, which has led to a tremendous influx of funds mm -hmm. into the space, mm -hmm. I would say the biggest one has certainly been the energy transition. Mm -hmm. With the focus on decarbonization globally, we don't believe that's a trend that's going to go away overnight. And that has been the biggest driver. I would say most of our power and renewables portfolio, since I've been here, it's almost all renewables. Hmm. Um, and so that's a trend that we don't see going away anytime in the near future. If anything, we have seen government policy look to support that increasingly more and more. Having said that, though, you look at Europe and you start seeing like there is still reliability is an essentiality and reliability. That's what infrastructure stands for. And reliability sometimes means that you have to stick with the old fossil fuel style. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in some ways, the amazing trend, Greg, is every single subsector within infrastructure is almost firing on all cylinders as a result. Mm. So while you have broad trends like decarbonization, driving energy transition, and the Inflation Reduction Act and legislation like that supporting substantial investment in the space, you still have old core infrastructure assets that still are very valuable assets. Mm. So. I think the the trend of energy transition has only grown the infrastructure opportunity set while still not really diminishing substantially the existing core and core plus style. Yeah. So how long those trends will stay in place, I don't know. Yep. But right now it's a great time to think about infrastructure because the growth across the space could be tremendous. Okay. You're talking trillions of investment required. Um, globally, yeah, to so meet the needs. Really, a long-term structural trend underpinning the growth there. Now, here's a question for you: Is that in terms of how you and the team are structuring these transactions, pricing them, looking for value? I wonder: Are there parts of that market though that get almost too much investment and become overheated? So, if you think about different parts of the renewable spectrum, for for instance. Um, how are you assessing kind of value in that space? Yeah, as I sort of mentioned when we started this topic, um, the influx of capital has been tremendous across all of infra, in particular in renewables, primarily solar and wind. Mm. When we established the group here at Bearings, solar and wind financings were some of the most attractive risk return opportunities. They were all contracted and we were getting very nice spreads on those deals. Now, what we're finding as more and more capital comes in the space and, if you will, the low hanging fruit of opportunities is kind of now gone mm. in the utility scale space, what you're finding is sponsors now have to reach to get their return targets met. And so what we have seen is a trend where perhaps there's more risk being pushed on to not just the equity, but also the lenders, okay. whether that's commodity price risk, whether that's credit counterparty risk, whether that's operating risk or cost risk. We have seen power generators now look to terminate their offshore wind contracts because the prices they had agreed to no longer are economic mm. for them. Mm. So they're willing to pay, in one case, almost 50 million in penalties to terminate a contract because it's not economic for them to build the offshore wind platform. Mm. So there is more risk in the space. And because of the influx of capital, we have not seen what we feel to be a commensurate increase in return for that risk. Okay. So the amount of renewable activity for solar and wind that we did six years ago is no longer an indicator of the type of activity we're doing in the space now for solar and wind. Yep. Having said that, there are still plenty of other renewable categories where we are seeing interesting risk return attributes. Yeah, such as? So for example, food waste. Hmm. Um, what do you do with all the food waste? A lot of the food waste, unfortunately, gets thrown into landfills. And states such as California are encouraging people to figure out alternatives. And in fact, passing legislation to encourage a new way of handling that. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing are renewable fuel style systems where you'll take food waste, recycle it, and convert it into renewable fuels. Mm -hmm. And the states are stepping up and entering into contracts to support that effort. Mm -hmm. 
And that becomes interesting because then you start getting into sort of renewable energy and social infrastructure blending into one right. in many ways. And we have done a number of those deals. Not all renewable deals are like that. Some renewable deals rely purely on subsidies. Mm -hmm. And it's possible we may find those deals attractive, but we see enough opportunity in traditional contracted deals around renewable fuels and waste processing that we think that's a segment that's going to continue to grow. Yeah, interesting. So it's not just investing in quote unquote renewables with a broad brush. You got to really lift up the hood and, and look at the supply demand capital dynamics in each space to see like what the risk return opportunities are really looking like. So it's interesting to hear a little bit of that kind of nuance there. You mentioned some uh, government policy, um, and I, I think it's worth talking a little bit more about that because. That, I think, can be a big driver of where there are potential investment opportunities in this space. So obviously, we've got the Inflation Reduction Act here in the States. In Europe, there's the European Fund for Sustainable Development. So tell me just broadly how you and the team are thinking about kind of riding the tailwinds of those big government programs, or, or how do you invest into that as a trend? Selectively, carefully. Yeah. Um, with a lot of thought. Mm. What we are seeing right now is, again, potentially great opportunities. We are, you know, it used to be we would want to do a $100 million deployment on deals and we'd want to see the best wind and solar projects. Having said that, though, we are seeing a lot of small growth companies looking for capital up and down the balance sheet, hmm. senior, junior, equity like. And we're finding that our investors, for ESG or other reasons, are very interested in supporting these type of efforts. So we are spending a lot of time underwriting, make sure we're comfortable with the business model. But the amount of small startup entities taking advantage of these opportunities, and you mentioned some federal and, and regional things, it's occurring at the state level too. It's mm. occurring at the local level. Mm -hmm. There are possibly thousands of similar opportunities popping up constantly. Mm. Um, our biggest issue, Greg, is funneling through all the opportunities to make sure that we're seeing the best um, and the most representative of what we think infrastructure should be going forward. Yeah. Um, but it's not from a lack of opportunities Got it. that I'm worried about. Okay. So that, that kind of brings me to one of my last questions here is thinking about you mentioning how do you, how do you funnel through these opportunities? And I would imagine you need the right team in place to, to be able to, to do that. So let's talk a little bit about and full disclosure. Obviously we're an infrastructure debt manager and we're probably biased in the way we answer this question, but what, what do you, what do you think investors should look for in a manager if they're looking to deploy capital into this asset class? Well, if we go back and we kind of summarize some of the things we talked about mm. from the market perspective, right? The the majority of the market is private and not openly available to investors in general. Yep. It is a market that you rely on a long history and trying to determine that essentiality, whether that's from history or from past experiences. And we also have said it's evolving and changing. And a lot of different sort of skill sets are sort of blending into what the new infrastructure world is going to be over time. So I think what that means is like what I would look for in a manager, I would certainly want an institution that is that has multiple skill sets. Mm. So for example, it's not surprising, but real estate and infrastructure blend in mm -hmm. many, many ways. And that is a marriage that we think is going to continue mm. to evolve over time. And we work very closely uh, with our real estate folks because at some point in time, you know, there are a lot of opportunities that involve taking a real estate skill set, whether it's because it's a real estate is your credit counterparty, a developer there that you're working on, or for example, some of the most interesting deals we've done have been ground leases around renewable assets mm. and understanding like how to think from a real estate perspective about your collateral there. Right. So structured credit is another example. Increasingly more and more as you get into what we call distributed gen mm -hmm. or individuals like you and me or small companies doing their own renewable systems, it's very tough to underwrite that with a single financing. So what you'll do is you'll do a structured credit financing mm. around a pool 
Got of it. borrowers like that. So you, you just named the last two podcast episodes that we did. So are you saying I should have just invited you to our commercial real estate and structured credit uh, podcast? Or vice versa. Yeah. Um, and I talk to our my bearings colleagues all the time. Mm-hmm. Digital infra used to be called telecom. Right. And we have great analysts on our public fixed income desk that I rely on as long as along with our energy analysts. Mm-hmm. So having that skill set across the institution is huge, along with the origination aspect. We like to think as a team, are, we have the relationships out there, and, and certainly that is a critical part of it, and we believe we do because of who we are. But the institution matters too. The institution has relationships across the globe, and we are lucky in that we get opportunities coming from all over the organization, mm-hmm. uh, including mm-hmm. our parent, Mass Mutual. So that is an important aspect because, as I said, you can't find these deals on your computer screen. Mm. You have to go out and know where to dig them up. And from that perspective, I believe we have a, a clear advantage in that regard. And on top of that, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of the team that we have here on our infrastructure, we're former bankers. Mm. We have been at buy and hold institutions. Remember, the banks have been 90% of the capital provided to this space. There are a lot of lessons learned. And you have to know the sponsors. You have to know how the structures work. You have to know how they go through cycles. We are only now, for the first time, dealing in an interest rate and inflation cycle that generations of investors have not lived through. Hmm. We have, because we've been doing this for over 20 years, uh, and in the case of bearings, for even longer than that. So we believe having that experience, having the origination expertise, and then having the institutional knowledge to handle how the infrastructure industry is going to evolve, those are huge. And what we like to think at the end of the day is, let's not ignore the global aspect. Mm. We are called global infrastructure. And the reason for that is, if you look at infrastructure, it's not a North America dominated market. It is very global, and in particular, it's Europe and North America. And what we like to do is deliver a representative portfolio to our investors. We are about 50-50, North America and Europe. And that is about what the infrastructure market is generally. Um, And that's an important aspect, having that global diversity. Because infrastructure in Europe is not exactly infrastructure in America. Europe is more economic and social infrastructure. The US is more energy focused. Having that blend is important. Makes a lot of sense. So it's the origination platform, it's experience, and it's uh, being able to take that global perspective. Um, Well, listen, Orhan, thank you for this, what has been kind of a whirlwind tour through infrastructure debt. Uh, It's been educational for me, hopefully for our listeners as well. Um, But I know it's probably only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, So one thing I would do is I would point people to the white paper that you and your colleagues have just published. It's called the Evolving Opportunity in Infrastructure Debt. And I will link to that in the show notes so people can click right into that and check that out. I want to give you the opportunity to have the last word here. So if there's any one key message you want to leave listeners with today, go for it. Well, I think as I mentioned earlier, um, this is as exciting a time as I've ever seen in any infrastructure debt space. I think both from an investor and from an opportunity set perspective, between the organic trends and the cyclical trends, it's tough for me to figure out what is challenging about infrastructure debt relative to other asset classes right now. I'm clearly biased. I make no apologies about that, (laughs) but I think it's a product that holds its own from a credit performance perspective, from a relative value perspective. And I think right now we're benefiting from both, whether it's legislative policy or organic trends um, that I don't think are temporary. And I think if you haven't thought about this product as an addition to your portfolio, I think it's a great time to start thinking about it. Well, it's nice to hear some strong conviction about an asset class at a time when I think not a lot of people have very strong conviction around uh, markets right now, just given you know some of the uncertainty and volatility that we've seen. So, well, this has been great, Orhan. I uh, hope to do it again sometime soon, but thanks for joining me. Thanks again for listening to episode number 11 of season eight of Streaming Income. This is the last episode of this season. We will be taking a month off and we will be back in September. If you'd like to stay up to date on our latest thoughts on asset classes ranging from high yield and private credit to real estate and emerging markets, make sure to follow us and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and more. 
And if you have specific feedback, you can email us at podcast at bearings.com. That's podcast at B-A-R-I-N-G-S.com. Thanks again for listening, and we will see you in September.